Have you ever, like, stopped to think about why blue feels the way it does? Blue. Yeah, you know, like the color blue. Not just like, oh, I see blue and I know it's blue, but like the actual experience of it. Mm -hmm. Or like how a melody can, like, totally make you feel things. Yeah. It's these kinds of questions that kind of get at this huge mystery yeah consciousness it really is a mystery like it seems so basic on the surface right totally but the deeper you go it's like whoa what's actually going on here and that's what this deep dive is all about exactly the hard problem of consciousness i love that name i know right <laughs> it was actually this philosopher david chalmers who came up with it oh right he's got a whole bunch of articles and research and even some like crazy thought experiments to try and make sense of it all i'm really excited to dig into this with you me too so to get us started, yeah. what's like the central question here? Well, I guess it's like, why does all the physical stuff in our brains, you know, all the neurons firing and everything, yeah. why does that create the feeling of experience? That is a great question. And it's important to understand that this is different from the so-called easy problems of consciousness. Oh, yeah, hold on. Easy problems. Yeah. I know the name's kind of misleading because yeah. they're actually pretty complex. Yeah. But these are things like how the brain processes information, focuses, attention, forms memories, that sort of thing. So those are the easy problems. Yeah. We're actually making pretty good progress figuring those out. Interesting. <laughs> but here's the thing. Even if we knew everything about how the brain works at that level, yeah. we still wouldn't know why those processes feel like something. Like, why isn't it all just sort of like a silent mechanical process happening in the dark? Exactly. That's the heart of the hard problem. So it's kind of like we could explain all the gears and springs inside a clock. Uh-huh. But that doesn't tell us why it feels like time is passing when we watch the hands move. Wow. That's a perfect analogy. Right. And this is where I think David Chalmers and his philosophical zombie thing comes in. Oh, yeah. The zombies. So tell me about that. Well, imagine there's this being that's physically identical to you. Okay. Like down to the last atom. Wow. It acts like you, talks like you. Really? Creepy. But there's a big difference. No consciousness. So like a super realistic robot that can act just like a human. Well, it's even more radical than that. Oh. Because a robot still has like a different physical structure right a philosophical zombie is physically indistinguishable from you okay but there's simply no feeling of what it's like to be them so there's nobody home exactly and that's what makes the thought experiment so interesting i can see that it suggests that consciousness might be something extra extra something that doesn't automatically come with physical processes okay i'm following you like if you can imagine a being that's physically you but without consciousness yeah then maybe consciousness isn't just a side effect of being physical. Like there's got to be something more going on. It's not just the hardware of the brain. It's like there's some kind of software or maybe even something beyond software that we're missing. That's a great way to put it. So if consciousness is more than just neurons doing their thing, how do we even begin to understand it? Well, that's where things get even wilder, because we have to deal with subjectivity. Subjectivity. The fact that each of us has our own unique first-person view of the world. Right. Like, what it's like to be me is different from what it's like to be you. Exactly. And that's what's so tough to wrap our heads around. Yeah. I mean, how do you study something that's all about what it feels like from the inside? It's a real challenge. And this is where another philosopher comes in, Thomas Nagel. Okay. And his famous bat analogy. Oh, I love good analogy. Well, Nagel asks us to imagine what it's like to be a bat. Okay. We can study their brains, their echolocation, their behavior, everything about how they work. Right. Okay. But we can never truly know what it feels like to be a bat experiencing the world through sonar. Yeah, our, our senses are just too different. Exactly. So even with all the science in the world, we'd still be missing that crucial piece the bat's subjective experience. Okay, now I'm really starting to see why this is called the hard problem. Right. We've got zombies and bats yeah. and the limits of science. So where do we go from here? Well, there's this other philosopher, Joseph Levine. Okay. And he talks about something called the explanatory gap. Explanatory gap. Yeah, it's like even if we knew every single physical fact about the brain, mm -hmm. we'd still be missing the explanation for why those facts lead to the feeling of experience. So it's like... We can explain how lightning works. Right. But we don't know why it looks the way it does or like why pain feels painful. Exactly. We have descriptions and explanations, but the essence of the experience itself, that's still a mystery. 
Okay, so we've laid out the problem. We have. Now I'm ready for some solutions. Or at least some attempts to deal with this gap. Right, because there's got to be some ideas out there. Oh, there are tons, and some of them are pretty wild. Okay, lay it on me. What are the main contenders in this philosophical battle royale? Well, one really radical approach is called eliminativism. Eliminativism. As the name suggests, it gets rid of consciousness completely. Whoa. Some philosophers argue that consciousness isn't actually a real thing. What? That it's just a kind of illusion created by our brains. That is a bold move. It is. But it does solve the hard problem in a way. Right. If there's no consciousness, there's nothing to explain. <laughs> exactly. But I got to say... I don't know if I'm ready to give up on my own consciousness just yet. Yeah, I understand that. So what else is there? Well, on the completely opposite end of the spectrum, you have dualism. Dualism? Okay, I've heard of that. This is the classic mind-body split going all the way back to Descartes. Right. Dualists believe that consciousness is separate from the physical world. So like a soul or a spirit that exists apart from the body. Yeah, that's one way to think about it. Okay. But then the question is, how do the mind and body interact if they're made of totally different stuff? Right. How does a non-physical mind control a physical body? It's a tough one to answer. Okay, so we've got the extremes, getting rid of consciousness or making it completely separate. Mm -hmm. What's in the middle? There's actually a lot of interesting stuff in between. Okay. Some people think we can reduce consciousness to brain processes. It's just that we haven't figured out how yet. Okay, so this is reductionism. Exactly. But even within reductionism, there are different camps. Oh. Some think we might be able to explain consciousness with our current understanding of physics, while others think we need completely new laws of nature. I see. It's all about how far we can push our current scientific knowledge. Okay, so reductionism keeps it all within the realm of science, but it's still working on the how. Right. Are there any views that try to make consciousness like a basic part of the universe itself? Absolutely. One that's becoming more and more popular is called panpsychism. Panpsychism. Okay, I've heard of this one, but it's kind of mind-blowing. It is. Panpsychism says that consciousness is a fundamental property of all matter, not just brains. So like rocks, trees, even electrons have some level of consciousness. Yes, even if it's incredibly basic. So it's like consciousness is woven into the fabric of reality itself. Exactly. And that would mean the hard problem isn't about creating consciousness from nothing. It's more about how those simple forms of consciousness combine and grow to create the kind of rich inner experience we humans have. Right. It's a totally different way of looking at things. Okay, my brain needs a minute to process all that. <laughs> I know it's a lot to take in, but that's what makes this topic so fascinating. Wow, panpsychism is a pretty big idea. It is. But it seems like all these different approaches to the hard problem. Yeah. From eliminativism to panpsychism. Uh-huh. They're all still struggling with that basic mystery. Right. How do we get from the physical world to subjective experience? Yeah, that's the million dollar question. Exactly. And I think that's what makes this whole area of studies so fascinating. Totally. We're really pushing the boundaries of what we know about ourselves and the universe. So for our listeners who are like totally hooked right now. I hope so. Where would you point them if they want to learn more and really dive deeper into these ideas? Oh, there are so many great resources out there. Yeah. If you want to go straight to the source of the hard problem, okay. David Chalmer's book, The Conscious Mind, is a must read. I've heard of that one. It's definitely challenging. Yeah. But it really lays out the core arguments and all the different perspectives. Okay, that's going on my reading list. Good. And what about if you want to really understand that what it's likeness problem? Oh, Thomas Nagel's paper, What Is It Like to Be a Bat, is a classic. Yeah, I think I've heard of that one too. It's pretty short. Good. But it really gets you thinking about the limits of what we can know about subjective experience. Okay, so those are two great starting points for the philosophy side of things. Yeah, definitely. What about the science? Is there any like cutting edge research happening? Oh yeah, there's tons of cool stuff going on in neuroscience and related fields. Cool. One theory that's making a lot of noise is Integrated Information Theory, or IIT. IT. It tries to measure consciousness based on how much information a system integrates. So like a brain with its billions of interconnected neurons would have a very high level of integrated information. Exactly. And according to IIT, the more integrated information a system has, the more conscious it is. Hmm. It's a controversial theory for sure. Yeah. But it offers a potential way to actually measure consciousness and compare it across different systems. So we could use IIT to measure the consciousness of like an AI. 
That's the idea, although there's still a lot of debate about whether IoT is really measuring consciousness or just something else like complexity. It seems like we're just starting to scratch the surface of this whole field. We really are, and one of the most exciting things about studying consciousness is that it forces us to question our most basic assumptions about the world and ourselves. And speaking of questioning assumptions, I want to go back to something you mentioned earlier. Yeah. The ethical implications of conscious AI. Oh, right. This is where things get really interesting and maybe even a little scary. It is. Because if we actually create a machine that has the same kind of subjective experience, mm -hmm. the same what its likeness as a human, Yeah. then we're facing some serious moral questions. We are. Like if it feels like something to be that machine, if it can feel joy and suffering, right? do yeah. we have a responsibility to treat it with the same respect and dignity as any other conscious being? That's a huge question. It really challenges our whole understanding of what it means to be human. It does, and what it means to be deserving of moral consideration. It's like science fiction is becoming a reality right in front of us. It kind of is, and that's why it's so important to have these conversations now yeah. before the technology gets ahead of our ethical understanding. Right. We need to be prepared for the implications of what we create. So the hard problem of consciousness isn't just this abstract puzzle for philosophers and scientists. Nope. It has real-world consequences that could affect all of us. Absolutely. And that's why it's so important for everyone to engage with these ideas. To think critically about what consciousness is and why it matters. And what kind of future we want to create with it. Okay. I'm feeling pretty overwhelmed, but in a good way. I know. It's a lot, but it's also incredibly exciting. It is. Yeah. Okay. So before we go too far down the rabbit hole of all these big questions, yeah. let's take a step back and recap some of the key points from our deep dive so far. Sounds good. So we've been talking about all these different ideas about consciousness. We have. I think it's time to like bring it all together. You yeah, know? make sense of it all. Exactly. What are the like key takeaways from all this for our listeners? Well, I think the biggest thing to remember is what makes the hard problem so hard. Okay. It's not just about understanding how the brain works, like the mechanics of it. Right. It's not enough to just know that neurons fire and communicate. <laughs> exactly. It's about understanding why all that physical activity creates the feeling of subjective experience. Right. Why does it feel like something to see a sunset or hear your favorite song or even just think a thought? That feeling that what it's likeness. Yeah. That's what makes consciousness so slippery. So even if we had like a complete map of every neuron in the brain, mm -hmm. we still wouldn't necessarily know why that creates the experience of tasting chocolate or feeling love. Exactly. It's like we have the blueprint for the machine, but we don't know how it makes us feel the ride. That's a good way to put it. And that's the gap we're trying to bridge. And we talked about some of the ways people are trying to do that. Yeah, all those different theories. From the folks who think consciousness is an illusion, Right, the eliminativists. To those who believe it's like a fundamental property of the universe. Like the panpsychists. It's a whole spectrum of ideas. And there's no one right answer, at least not yet. Right. Some people think we can explain consciousness with science. Like maybe with new discoveries in physics. But others think we need a completely new way of understanding the universe. It's all about how far we're willing to push our current thinking. And then there's panpsychism. Ah, yes, the mind-blowing one. Which says that consciousness isn't something that emerged from complex systems like brains. Uh-huh. But it's actually present in everything, even rocks and trees. In everything. Wow, it's a lot to take in. It is. But I think even if we don't have all the answers just thinking about these questions, yeah. it can change how we see the world. Absolutely. It makes you appreciate the mystery of it all. So for our listeners who want to explore all this further, yeah. where should they go? What resources would you recommend? Well, for the philosophy side of things, okay. David Chalmers' book, The Conscious Mind, is a great place to start. It's a tough one, but it's worth it. It is. And for something a little more accessible, yeah. Thomas Nagel's What Is It Like to Be a Bat <laughs> is a classic. <laughs> That's the one about the bat, right? Yes. It really gets you thinking about what it means to experience the world from another perspective. Okay, those are great for the philosophy side. Uh -huh. What about the science? Any researchers or theories our listeners should check out? Well, integrated information theory, or IIT, is really interesting. That's the one that tries to measure consciousness, right? Yes. Yeah. By looking at how much information a system integrates. So a brain would have a lot of integrated information. Right. And a rock would have very little. Exactly. It's a fascinating way to approach the problem. It seems like there's still so much to discover about consciousness. 
There is. We're just at the beginning. And it's not just about understanding the brain. No, it's about understanding what it means to be human. To be a conscious being in this vast universe. And maybe to understand the universe itself a little better. And we can't forget about the implications of all this for technology. Oh, right. Especially with AI becoming more and more advanced. But what happens if we create a machine that's actually conscious? Yeah, that opens up a whole new can of worms. What responsibilities would we have to a conscious machine? Big questions. Questions we need to be thinking about now. Definitely before it's too late. So the heart problem of consciousness, it's not just an academic exercise. It is not. It has real world implications for all of us. And it's something we can all engage with. No PhD required. Just a curious mind. Well, we've covered a lot of ground today. We have. From philosophical zombies to panpsychism. And everything in between. It's been quite a journey. A mind-bending one. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive into the hard problem of consciousness. It's been a pleasure. And until next time, keep exploring the mysteries of the universe and keep those brains buzzing. <laughs>